V1. Pull up. Pull up. Pull up. Terrain. Terrain. Pull up. Terrain. Welcome to the Flight Safety Detectives. Hosts John Golia and Greg Fife, two of the world's most respected aviation safety experts, talk all things related to aviation and aerospace. This podcast and the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel are brought to you by the Professional Aviation Maintenance Association, PAMA, and Avemco Insurance, a world-class provider of aviation insurance and your one-stop for all general aviation insurance needs. Get a customized quote at avemco.com or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Tell them you're a listener of the show and receive a 5% discount. Now it's time to buckle up because it's wheels up for the latest episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Well, hello, gentlemen. It is another episode of Flight Safety Detectives. Man, it feels like I've been gone forever. Uh, it's good to see you both and uh, do another show. Um, and I think this show is actually maybe going to close out the year for us this year. So uh, we'll get right into it. But before I do, um, because this is December, I've just been looking at the uh, the accidents. And given that we're recording this show early in December, it's already been a, uh, a fatality laced 10 days into the uh, into the month of December. There's been a number of accidents that we'll eventually get to in the first part of next year. But I'll tell you, I don't know what is going on. I know that we just come off of a holiday and that usually accounts for high fatality rate type accidents. And um, I'm hoping that uh, at least over the rest of the holidays that are coming towards the end of the year, uh, people will fly safe. So let's get into this particular accident. It's kind of interesting. It's back uh, from March of 2006 involving a single engine beach Bonanza. It was an A36 Bonanza. And it was being operated and flown by a uh, a guy who's a pilot, private pilot instrument rated, but he happens to be a, uh, a celebrity of sorts. And I'll let Todd uh, talk about that uh, briefly in a minute. But um, Apparently, this was going to be an angel flight. The pilot and a passenger were heading out of Santa Monica Airport in California, heading down to San Diego to pick up an angel flight uh, uh, patient and transport them. So on the initial takeoff, uh, coming out of Santa Monica, shortly after takeoff, the pilot experienced a uh, total loss of power. And unfortunately, because they were taken off to the west, they didn't have many options other than to put the aircraft down in the water, i.e. the Pacific Ocean. And so as the pilot uh, decided that uh, he was going to have to put the airplane down in the water, it was a controlled ditch. There were a lot of uh, witnesses on the beach that actually saw the aircraft. And there, in fact, are some pictures in the public docket, which Todd will post on our website, that actually show the airplane in a stable um, uh, attitude as it splashes down in the water, typically uh, what you want with a nose high attitude, dragging the tail into the water. Unfortunately though, even though the airplane didn't really get into deep water, it did sink after the after the airplane did land in the water. But the, the real curious thing about this particular accident is that there were two fatalities. And the question is why? Uh, it was a controlled ditch. It looks like it was performed as it should have been. And unfortunately, you had two fatalities. So as we started to dissect the NTSB report and the, the information in the docket, <laughs> once again, it becomes very evident that the NTSB shortcutted the process, went to an obvious cause for at least the engine failure, but never really talked about anything else as it relates to why you had two fatalities in an event that was really totally survivable. And so as we get into this, Todd, you know, I, you were looking at the, the, the pilot's background and there's some information in the public docket um, by Mitch Garber, who at the time was the doctor at the NTSB, who was dissecting um, some of the medical aspects of this particular pilot. Yeah. So this is a pilot who had about uh, 430 hours or so total time. I uh, was an instrument rated pilot flown about uh, 70 hours in the previous 12 months. And on the surface, it seemed to be uh, nothing untoward about his, his background as a pilot. 
until one scratches a little bit uh, below the surface. The medical examiner's report mentioned that in the mid-90s, the event happened in 2006, by the way. In the mid-90s, he'd actually been uh, refused a medical certificate because he had been taking drugs that were inconsistent with having a third-class medical. And uh, fast-forwarding a bit, the uh, report after the fact showed that there were several drugs in this person's system consistent with those uh, being used by people being treated for depression and other uh, issues. These are drugs which, in his medical few months before the event, checked off a box saying, no, he wasn't under any such drug. So it begs the question, what, if any, role this may have played in either this event or in his overall approach to following the rules and regulations? And that's a good way to put it, Todd, when you look at it, because, you know, you do have uh, pilots that are flying out there that think, well, it's not a big deal. I'm not going to report it on a medical. If I do, then I'm going to go through these hassles once again. So and who's going to find out unless I have an accident <laughs> or some sort of serious incident or something else takes place. And unfortunately, um, we're going to get into this a little more because these drugs we don't know exactly the amounts other than what was reported on the autopsy and the tox report, but where they fare against, were these half-life of the drugs? Have they just been taken? Did they have a full impairing effect or uh, were they uh, dissipated enough where it wouldn't have had any kind of influence? And we'll talk about that because that that's an important part of the survival aspects of this accident. But the bigger thing, John, is the uh, maintenance issue that was found with, or at least the mechanical issue that was found with the engine and, and really determined to be the cause of the total loss of failure. Yeah, it's quite interesting, the, the sequence of events around this, this engine. Now, this engine had been rebuilt, what they call a field rebuilt. I'm not quite sure I know what that is, but I assume it would meant it wasn't, wasn't back to the factory, call it a field overhaul. Uh, but there should really be not much difference between a, a field overhaul or a factory overhaul, unless it's the factory is replacing all new parts. You know, so there's different different levels. But in any event, it had flown some 735 hours since that uh, overhaul, even though the airplane sat in a warehouse for quite a while before it was installed in the airplane. Uh, but then about 230 hours ago, uh, prior to the accident, uh, it had all six cylinders, uh, pistons replaced and assumed piston rings uh, because of excessive blow-by on the annual inspection. So that's normally not a big deal. You don't disturb the uh, connecting rods at the crankshaft to do that. Although they, as you rotate it around to make this the assembly and disassembly, uh, process. They're right in your face. They're right up close. Uh, doesn't mention a word in the report about did the, did the individual do any inspections? They mentioned that it looked like a cotter pin was missing from one of the connecting rod bolts. Uh, that should have been obvious to the mechanic as they moved them around and installed the piston. Uh, so there's a lot of loose ends in this report as, as it pertains to uh, what happened when they were replacing these pistons. They go to great detail in the report with the metallurgy analysis and uh, the teardown and, and all sorts of uh, events that occurred after the pistons were replaced, after the accident. But they are a little light on the details around the piston replacement. Uh, the mechanic that was involved in this had two jobs. So he was working two jobs. They said he averaged five hours on the, this, uh, for this repair facility but he worked eight hours somewhere else. So that makes for a long day. It was in Los Angeles. So uh, I don't know what the traffic was like from work and uh, back home. Uh, I assume he worked at LAX, the, the mechanic, and then uh, drove to Santa Monica, which on some days can take forever. Uh, but in any event, they don't talk about fatigue. They don't talk about uh, procedures. I mean, there's so many things that could have been explored here and so many recommendations that could have been made to actually enhance maintenance down the road, but it's vacant. This report's vacant on all of it. 
And that's sad because the this is one of those accidents where, like you said, John, I mean, who's responsible? What procedures were they following or didn't follow? Where was the oversight? And don't you have to have multiple levels of inspection to say things are good to go before you button it all up and put it on the airplane and and say, you know, return to service? Where are all those established procedures? None of that was explored by this investigator in this report. Those are the basics. Those are the the root cause, of, you know, uh, of of this type of failure. Who actually broke it down? It's one thing for the guy who turned the wrench. Okay, they forgot to put the cotter key in. Why did they do that? Well, were they doing it with a with the proper procedure? Was he doing it from memory? Was I mean, where did it take place? Did it happen when they were replacing the piston or when the engine got overhauled some seven hundred hours? prior i mean those questions are not answered in this re report now if they just leave open-ended and that and there, therein lies the problem We're and then on top of that you know i mean the faa would be all over that if you got a repair station or somebody that's uh doing um you know the field type uh, overhaul like you were talking about the faa sure as heck would want to know who's doing this and did they follow the procedures if not we got a we got a real issue here either it's with the individual mechanic who did or didn't do something or if it's a repair station uh, i would think that they would be after the repair station to make sure that this is you know a one off and not a systemic problem and things like that but then we start looking at the uh, of course the survival aspects of this particular accident and like i said at the beginning um, apparently everybody said, yeah, the guy had the airplane under control. It's obvious that the airplane touched down. There's a picture of the airplane actually splashing into, into the water. And you can see that the nose of the aircraft is up. The tail is down typical in a ditching situation. The, the landing gear was up. So apparently the pilot had done the right thing. The problem is you got two fatalities and on the autopsy, it listed multiple blunt force trauma and drowning. And so now we get back to, well, what about seatbelts and shoulder harnesses? And the board found that there were no shoulder harnesses installed in the aircraft. And Todd, I know that when uh, when you're looking through the docket, there is a discussion, I guess, uh, with this pilot and the partner in the aircraft had talked about installing shoulder harnesses. Absolutely. The, uh, the public docket had a statement from the co-owner who discussed that, uh, yes, they knew that uh, lap belts, excuse me, shoulder belts were an option. And it was a good idea, but they decided against it because when they purchased the aircraft, it only had lap belts. And again, in retrospect, we know that uh, this kind of thing can easily prevent uh, blunt force trauma in less than catastrophic events. And if you look at some of the pictures we're posting of the aircraft that was recovered from the ocean, except for, I believe, the right passenger door being separated from the aircraft, the aircraft was largely intact. Yeah, there yeah. no major crush uh, uh, damage to the outside of the aircraft. It seems to me, as a non-expert in survivability, that if you had something to prevent the people from hitting the uh, instrument panel, they might have survived enough to get out of the aircraft and and make it to shore. And we see that over and over and over again when uh, when we have these types of events where you have a very rapid deceleration. In this case, because it was a ditching, uh, yeah, the airplane made a big splash. But uh, it decelerated very quickly. Everybody gets thrown forward. And if you don't have a shoulder harness on, that's why we've got shoulder harnesses in cars, because people were putting a you know face plan into the dashboard. And that's still happening in these small general aviation aircraft, these, especially the older ones that are not equipped originally with shoulder harnesses. It's a great idea to buy aftermarket shoulder harnesses. And you don't want the ones that mount to the seat, because those basically do not do what you need it to do because if the whole seat comes loose, you still got the same problem. You want the ones that actually mount to the airframe to give you the best benefit. And so now the question is, based on what you sir, uh, saw in the, in the docket and we've talked about, let's say the aircraft did have shoulder harnesses. They did survive the ditching. Would this pilot, based on the medications that uh, were found in the tox screen, would that have impaired his ability to extricate himself and or his passenger from the aircraft? And would they have still drowned? Or... And none of us here are medical experts or pharmacologists, whatnot. We're not in a position to judge whether or not the, the drugs that are found in his system, the pilot system, not the passenger system, would have impaired his ability to get out of the aircraft. That's a job for 
the NTSB or whoever else was assisting the NTSB in this investigation. The medical report talked about what was in the system, how much was in the system, didn't say whether this was above or below a value that would have been acceptable. It also said something else, that in 95, he was refused a medical certificate because of his use. He stated in his previous, in his last exam, that he wasn't using any of these drugs, yet several of them were found in his system. Perhaps it calls into question the uh, process that the FAA uses to ensure that people aren't uh, taking things they shouldn't when they get medical certificates. These are good questions. None of them were answered. And then the, the, the real issue I have, John, is when you read the probable cause, it's a very simplistic probable cause once again. And it really concerns me because is safety really being enhanced with a probable cause like this? Because as we've discussed on previous shows, <clears throat> I was taught when I first went to work for the, uh, the NTSB that engine failures don't cause accidents. And while that sounds is like, what are you talking about? If you really think about it, you have an engine failure and we'll talk about single engine airplanes. You're at altitude, any kind of altitude. The engine fails, stops producing uh, enough thrust to sustain flight. Have you had an accident yet? No. Has anybody been injured yet? Not necessarily, unless the engine explodes off the front end of that airplane and breaches the uh, the cabin and things like that. But uh, for the uh, example purposes, let's just say the engine's still intact, but in this case, it had a mechanical, an internal mechanical issue that caused it to stop producing power and thrust. So now the question is, now you've got a glider. That airplane was still intact, still flyable. And it's obvious that the pilot was able to get the airplane down in a controlled manner and a ditch. And it wasn't until the aftermath, that was the, the impact with the water, where damage to the aircraft occurred and injuries were incurred by the passengers. Yet this very simplistic probable cause that the NTSB put out was the NTSB determines the probable cause of the accident to be the failure of the aviation maintenance technician to properly torque and cotter pin the number two connecting rod bolt at their attach point to the crankshaft, which resulted in the separation of the connecting rod in flight and a complete power loss. Thank you very much for telling me the obvious. One, you don't identify who the quote mechanic is, what facility they were at, what, <laughs> what they were following, what they were doing. They didn't just magically not do that. Did they get distracted? Were they complacent? Were they fatigued? Were they rushed? All of these things, needed to be ferreted out to really determine why that was the problem that started the whole chain of events. But again, that engine failed in flight. The airplane hadn't crashed yet. Injuries hadn't been sustained. And when they talk about all the medical stuff, Todd, in, the, in Dr. Garber's report, it's buried in the docket. They don't mention it at all in the factual portion of the report. And then on top of that, they do allude to, in the factual report, things about shoulder harnesses. You know what? I want to know, as part of the probable cause and contributing factors as to why this was a fatal accident, what was the cause or contributing factor? It wasn't this engine failure. It was the fact that when they impacted the water and the airplane didn't have shoulder harnesses, that may have contributed or caused the, uh, the, the injuries that were significant enough to knock them unconscious because they had multiple blunt force trauma, and then they eventually drowned, which means they couldn't extricate themselves because of that trauma. That's a contributing factor to the fatality portion of this accident, not the fact that somebody forgot to put a cotter pin in a bolt. That just tells me what happened with the engine, but that doesn't tell me why this was a pure accident. Yeah, and you know, as you were going on, I was just, I was just thinking, the shoulder harnesses in the piece, I mean, we have seen, and we just did an accident not too long ago, where they attached the, the shoulder harness to the seat, the aluminum seat, right? And that, that was, it just, it gave way under the uh, forces. So it was as good as nothing. And, and the other piece that I've said on this show before, and we've had quite a few comments about, was I don't think that I'd go back flying today without some form of a helmet with a built-in headset. Because all we see in these survivable accidents is head injuries, right? And this little tiny switch draws a nice, nice big center punch hole right in the in your crank, in your head. And uh, 
and it's over. Otherwise, survivable, and it's over. You know, yeah, and, and and like Todd said, when you see the pictures, you're going, "How did two people die in this airplane?" Because the airplane is 90 percent intact, and uh, and it is. It is something as simple as that, John, where you get thrown forward because you're not restrained, and now you are hitting dials, switches, knobs, and a variety of other little things that exist on an instrument panel in any general aviation aircraft. Yep. Head injury. Yeah. Head, head injuries, head injuries. I mean, yeah. we have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of otherwise survivable general aviation accidents. You know, and so, the military has helicopter, or every, every pilot, regardless of the, the airplane, has a helmet. Right? There's a reason for it. They've experienced it. Now, yeah. you've seen it, but you know what? We can't even get shoulder harnesses. So what are the chances of getting a, uh, a regulation on helmets? Uh, not very good. Yeah, well, you know, you can't go out there and fly a nice airplane with a helmet on and get out of that and still look good because you'll get helmet hair and you won't really look cool when you get out of the airplane. So people aren't going to wear a helmet. But the point being, the takeaway from this is that if you have an older aircraft, an older general aviation airplane, I don't care which one it is, if it doesn't have shoulder harnesses, you should put them in there. And the reason for it is this particular type of accident where you're successful in doing something, you get the airplane down in a field because you had an engine problem or whatever, only to die because the airplane came to a, an instant stop and you got launched through the front end or you got thrown forward. Why? Because you were not restrained from the waist up. And we've all seen, especially in this line of work, we've all seen very survivable accidents. I don't know how many I've done where I walked up going, I just don't understand how five people could have died in this accident when the airplane is still intact, the seats are in place, yet five people lost their lives. And a lot of it is because they were not restrained by shoulder harnesses and that they came forward. The two front seat people hit the instrument panel or things along the, the instrument panel and the people in the back hit the seat in front of them. And again, those are metal seats. They have little things that are sticking up. They're sharp things. They got headrests that are in front of them and they end up hitting the supports for those headrests or some other bracket on the back of a seat. It's, it's that fast. So the point being, you got a general aviation airplane, spend the money. That's what it's all about. Spend the money to ensure the highest levels of safety by putting in shoulder harnesses. That's the bottom line. So, well, you picked a good accident, Todd, the dissect. And uh, again, I think, uh, you know, with this, and this guy was a game show host, <laughs> you know, Okay, so he's definitely not, he, he definitely wants to look pretty when he gets out of the airplane. He's not going to wear a helmet, John. But, uh, he, you know, they should have had shoulder harnesses. They talked about it. I can't believe he talked about it and then decided, ah, eh, we don't need them. Really? Then why'd you even talk about it? So it's kind of curious, those those little discussions, if you will. No, so, I like, we had some comments when I made that, uh, my comment about helmets. We had some people contact us. I wonder if they ever did anything with that, with the helmet. One guy said he was definitely going out and getting himself a helmet. Uh, I wonder if he did it. Well, I'll tell you what, the guy, whoever sent that message to us saying they were going out and getting a helmet, give us a follow-up. We want to see you in your helmet. Love to see that. So, well, gentlemen, um, like I said, it's always good to be back with you. And we dissected, I think, a good accident. It's a it's a perfect accident to talk about the little things, not the big things that can hurt you or kill you in, uh, in general aviation aircraft. And it is better to be safe than sorry. And it's worth spending the money. So, Todd, because uh, the matriarch here, you know, gets the last word. Is well, he the this... matriarch or the patriarch? Patriarch, patriarch. No, no, no. He's the matriarch for us. <laughs> the matriarch is my cute little doggy here. but Because uh, John is the mother of all mothers. Well, as far as last words, I was thinking about, once again, what's a good last word for this? Well, we I don't think we mentioned his name. This uh, game show host was Peter Tomarkin, who was 
did a bunch of game shows in the 80s and 90s. Uh, his most famous one was coincidentally called Press Your Luck. Ah, well, this was I not a situation, I believe, where he pressed his luck because luck implies something out of your control, something random, something, you know, due to the actions of the fates. This was about managing risk. And there are a couple of places where he did manage his risk well, in my opinion. One was his implied use of, uh, you know, prescription medications that were banned for use by someone who's a pilot. And there's nothing clear that shows that this might have been a, a factor. But still, if you're playing by the rules other than the regulations, you're increasing your risk. The other risk increase was by him and his co-owner having a conversation at some point and deciding, you know what? These uh, shoulder belts might help us, but uh, this airplane didn't come with them, so what the heck. And the other place where risk was not managed was by the NTSB. There are several issues we saw here, which at the very least they should have raised or should have explicitly put into the causal statement or the supporting statement for the causes of this, of this event. So uh, let this be a lesson. Learn from, I wouldn't say errors, learn from the decisions of others Whereas we've said here today, those decisions could have been better. Yeah, no, that's a great way to put it, Todd. And yes, John, everything I say that sounds derogatory is with love from my heart. Trust me. So I will leave you with our last words. It's, it's like Putin's love for, for uh, <laughs> I don't even want to finish it because I'm laughing. <laughs> but in any event, it, as I say, at the end of every show if you're going to go flying do a good session of pre-planning you know this is a good example of an engine take a, a takeoff with an engine failure on takeoff now, they happen all too often it's a period of time in that engine's performance where it's under the maximum strain if something's going to go that's when it's going to go and you should have in your mind laid out way, where you're going to go with the airplane and I would give this guy the benefit of the doubt. I think he was ready for it. I think he did the right thing. He got it down in the right attitude. I think he was was uh, prepared. Uh, just the outcome didn't go as it should have. No shoulder harnesses. Maybe they're cheap. Maybe uh, they didn't want you know didn't want it. Uh, I, I fall back on my helmet. Protect your head. Doesn't have to be fancy even, but get something to protect your head. And after you get out to the airport, do a good pre-flight. We see far too many accidents that either appear or are caused by a messy pre-flight. I still see them. I just saw one within the last three days, four days at the airport. A guy went out and all of a sudden he was in the airplane starting it up. He hadn't been out there but a couple of minutes. I wasn't watching him through the whole event. But I, I, I mean, it was, I was just went from about 25 feet, 30 feet, and he was a, approaching the airplane, and then he was in it, starting the engine. I know he couldn't have done a pre-flight in that time. And uh, make sure you touch your airplane. Wiggle everything. Make sure it's tight. After a while, you'll get to know all of those, what wiggles, what's a little wiggle, what's a lot wiggle, all the flight controls, tabs, everything. And then after you get in the air, you're not done yet. After you get in the air, you got to put that head on a swivel. You know, see and avoid. I see numbers that are like 60, 70% uh, effectiveness of see and avoid. But that's the only defense we have. You've got to do see and avoid. You've got to keep that head of yours moving. You keep those eyeballs all around. I mean, we've had just in, just in the last few months, we've had several accidents where see and avoid was a factor. So please, please, we don't want to lose the airplanes. We don't want to lose our pilots, especially our student pilots. So please pay attention and fly safely. To listen or watch more episodes of this show, go to FlightSafetyDetectives.com, the Flight Safety Detectives YouTube channel, or your favorite place to listen to podcasts. To contact John and Greg about the show, send them an email at flightsafetydetectives at gmail.com. And remember, for aviation insurance needs, contact Avemco Insurance at avemco.com 
or give them a call at 888-879-0389. Mention Flight Safety Detectives and receive a 5% discount. Thanks for listening to the Flight Safety Detectives and remember to always fly safe.